What's the title of that um, second song after uh, We Will Bless the Lord? I thank, I thank the Lord. I thank God. Who, who sings, the, who's there? Which church or which band? House Fire. Okay. Cute, cute song. <laughs> the lyrics. Now, cute, cute, but uh, meaningful. Okay, um, this morning, uh, we're going to go through a familiar story, uh, the woman at the well. But before that, I want to start with an illustration which uh, some of you may be familiar with. Some of you may have heard this illustration before. Apparently, I've always thought this was a real um, event, but it was just an illustration. Okay. Um, a transcript of, an, of a radio conversation of a U.S. naval ship with Canadian authorities off the coast of Newfoundland in October 95. So this is a radio conversation. So then the Americans, um, you have to understand the stereotypes a bit. Okay, so Americans are Americans and Canadians are perceived to be friendly and gentler than Americans. Okay, so Americans. Americans say, please divert your course 15 degrees to the north to avoid a collision. Canadians say, recommend you divert your course 15 degrees to the south to avoid a collision. Americans said, this is the captain of a U.S. Navy ship. I say again, divert your course. Canadians say, no, I say again, you divert your course. So then this is the Americans, okay? All capital letters, all in bold italics. This is the aircraft carrier USS Lincoln, the second largest ship in the United States Atlantic fleet. We are accompanied by three destroyers, three cruisers, and numerous support vessels. I demand that you change your course 15 degrees north. That's one, five degrees north, right? Just to be more insulting or countermeasures will be undertaken to ensure the safety of this ship. The Canadians say, this is a lighthouse, your call. Right? Some of you may have heard this illustration before. Now, the purpose of this illustration is um, to place ourselves um, and to identify ourselves and put us in the right place. So many times, Many times we think we are important. Many times we think we are a big deal. Many times we, are, we think we have arrived. Right? So who you are is important. Your identity is important. But who you really are is even more important. Right? So God is gracious in a way that whenever we think we have arrived at this place where you feel like, I'm the most amazing person in the world. God lets you meet situations or people uh, to put you back, you know, hey, come on, boy or girl. Settle down. Yeah. Calm down. Um, let me take care of this or know your place. Okay? We think too highly of ourselves. Just like the captain of this ship, right, the war destroyer, the USS Lincoln, thought he was so important. Ah, this Canadian, small, little Canadian, friendly, cute Canadian. You know, I can tell these Canadians to move their course. But he learned that these Canadians is not any Canadians, it's not even a ship, it's a lighthouse. So then when you understand your place or when you understand who you really are, the lighthouse cannot change its course, but the ship has to change its course, its trajectory. So the vessel changed its course. Now the woman at the well, whom we are about to meet or meet again for some of you, is a Samaritan woman. Right? Samaritan woman. Samaritans have their own religion. They are not the same as the Jewish faith. They are in fact sworn enemies. The Jews and the Samaritans are sworn enemies. And in order for her life to be transformed, in order for her life to change from a vagabond to a, a saved child of God, she has to change, right? From a traveler to someone who follows Jesus. And this story is deliberately, 
place after John 3, which is John 4, the, you can do maths, okay? 3 is after 4, okay? 4 is after 3, okay? You can do maths. But it's, it's placed as a contrast because John 3, we met a guy called Nicodemus, right? So Nico, right, let's just call him Nico. Nico um, is at the extreme end of this woman. If you want to place them on a scale, Nicodemus is you know, schmick, like righteous, top-notch religious guy. And you meet this unnamed woman, deliberately unnamed, so each of us can identify with this woman. This unnamed woman is on the other end of the scale, even like maybe off the charts, not even on the same scale as Nicodemus. So unrighteous, <clears throat> so unholy, so sinful. And we meet this woman. But both of them are in the same situation as us, that we have to change our course of life in order to to be transformed to meet Jesus. Okay? So, let's move on. Okay, um, location. Location is important. Looks so small, okay, but. Uh, <laughs> so we start our journey. Okay, I'll try to break it down because we, we are going through a lot of verses, but I'm going to try and break it down piece by piece so it's uh, clear to follow. Right, let's turn to our Bible. In John chapter 4, we're going to go through verse 1 to 42. Okay, but not all of them. Um, don't worry. Okay, so verse 1 to 3. Jesus and the woman of Samaria. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, brackets, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. So if you see the map on the screen, uh, Jesus was in Judea. Judea was a busier city. So Jesus was getting a lot of heat, a lot of attention. And he decided because it was not his time yet to be crucified, right? So he, he's the one who decides when he'll be crucified. He decided it wasn't his time yet um, to be crucified. So he retreated. To Galilee, so up north, right from the south, up to the north. So if you see in the middle there, is a town called or uh, a province called Samaria. Okay, and typically, um, this is debatable, but typically, when Jewish people travel from Judea to um, Galilee, they don't take the M1 shortcut up north. They will do a detour of um, to Rack Road, Burwood Road, and then um, they, they arrive at uh, um, Galilee. Okay, so they do a detour. Why? Because the Jewish people have this um, understanding that the Samaritans' filth and sin is contagious, like a virus. To even be in the same place, to even breathe the same air as the Samaritans, is like catching a virus. So they don't want to be in this, not even want to step on the ground. But apparently it's debatable whether it's most Jews, some Jews, or only a few extreme Jewish people who did that. But the point is, you see there's a shortcut or could have taken a detour. Now there's a key word here in verse 4. Okay, So we move on with our story. So verse 4. And he had to, so had to, here is a key, key word. He had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sikar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. So the details here are important. Okay? Verse 6, Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. And there's a long history why Samaritans and Jewish people hated each other. So Samaritans are, um, in modern terms, they are not pure breeds. So they are not pure breed Israelites. They have mixed with um, Gentiles. Right? The, the king of Assyria, when um, the king of Assyria attacked the northern kingdom, so this is what happens right, in the olden days when... Um, <clears throat> A foreign king attack a land, 
they remove all the people from that land and transport deports them somewhere else and then he will he would bring his own people and uh, replace the people there so it, there's a mix of jewish and um, some non-jewish people and they become samaritans so you can see how that is a problem and how um, the impurities of the gentiles are just disgusting to to the jewish people so and then you see here as well there's um, uh, a location which is a well okay for us maybe a well is not what so what okay so what so what about the well now the well is um, significant because it indicates um, a place where God often and God meets people there um, for example in Genesis 24 verse 11 let's quickly go there Genesis 24 verse 11 Genesis 24, verse 11. And he made the camels kneel down outside the city by the well of water at the time of evening, the time when women go out to draw water. So this is the story when um, Rebecca, Isaac's wife, um, came out to draw water. So the well is a place where um, romance is um, created okay, in the Bible. So there's Isaac and Rebecca, there's Jacob and Rachel, um, there's even Moses' story meeting uh, Zephora. So, if you're single, you might be wondering, help me find a well, okay? So, the well is a place of romance in the, in the Bible. And this woman is about to meet Jesus, of course not in that kind of romance, but in a divine romance, in a divine pursuit, where God, Jesus, will pursue this woman and um, down. Okay, so we'll, we'll explore their conversation. Uh, turn back to John, John chapter 4, verse 7 to 9. And one more important detail here that is easily miserable, okay, if you don't um, pay attention. Miserable, I don't know if that's an English word, but Jesus in verse 6, right? Jesus wearied as he was from his journey. Like, think about it. Do you, do you think of the word weary when Jesus is spoken? Like, Jesus and weary spoken on the same sentence. It's not usually you know, a, a picture that comes into your head. So you can imagine, like, um, maybe Mike, after he's done his 16 supersets of weights, and you're like... <sighs> so you can see the humanity of Jesus at, at this point. He was weary. And that going back to that word that he had to, of course, he knew what God the Father wanted him to do, but also he had to pass through there. Why? It's just logical. It makes sense. It's the shortcut that for him to get from um, Judea to Galilee. And he was tired. So this is Jesus showing his um, humanity as well to us. That even though he was God, he was also human. All right, so verse 7 to 9. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Brackets, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Verse 9. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? Brackets again. For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. So now you understand, after I told you the historical context briefly about the Jewish people and the Samaritans, they hate each other to bits, right? Um, the Samaritans had a temple um, that the Jewish people burned and destroyed as well. So um, a lot of animosity, a lot of, um, yeah, probably a bit like Israel uh, in, in the modern days. So you come and arrive at this scene and you see these two people who cannot be more different, right? If you've ever um, stepped into a lift before, right? And maybe you live in an apartment, um, I want to say like 30th floor, okay? You press the lift. You're tired from work. You're listening to a podcast, you know, BIC Melbourne podcast, um, 
you're hoping for a quiet day, you step into the lift, and then suddenly someone runs. <laughs> oh, hold, hold it on. Okay, hold it on. Oh, no, this is this person that I don't want to meet. I don't want to speak to this person, right? Step into the lift. Why? Because you are listening to a sermon, right? You don't want to be sinful and close, 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 close. Okay. Um, you step into the lift. You cannot be more different than this person. You have nothing to talk about. Awkward silence, right? They say that you can cut the thickness with a, with a knife, okay? So the, Jesus and this woman cannot be any more different. They are poles and poles apart. But the way Jesus started to woo her, W double O, okay, starts to woo her, starts to draw her in, is by first saying, <clears throat> give me a drink. Right? Starting this conversation, give me water. And this caught the woman off guard. She's like, what? What, man? Like, I'm a woman. I'm a Samaritan woman. You're a Jewish man. You should, you, you're not even supposed to talk to me, let alone ask for water. Right? Not even supposed to talk, let alone ask for water. So why does Jesus do this? Right? This is for you to ponder. Why does he ask for water to drink? And this woman is asking this question, but Jesus didn't offer the answer, right? Jesus is just, bang, opening the door for this conversation, give me water. So the water is the entry point of the conversation. Verse 10. To 14. Uh, can you help me at the back? Thank you. So verse 10 to 14. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir. So the woman identifies Jesus at first as just any ordinary Jewish traveler. Right? There would have been many Jewish travelers who traveled from Judea to Galilee. Sir, you have nothing to draw water with. You have no buckets. You have nothing. Right? You're empty-handed. You have nothing to draw water with. And the well is deep. The well is about 100 feet. Right? Really, really, really deep. Nothing. Nothing in your hands. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water, water welling up to eternal life. So now Jesus starts to peel the onions, right? Starts to open up... Um, the issues that he will reveal that this woman has. But he started from talking about water, but um, <clears throat> he is now saying, I've asked you for water, but I want to show you that the one who needs the water is not me, but you. You are the one who is in need of this water. So what is this water talking about? What is this water that Jesus is saying that this woman needs? Right? Because he doesn't know who this man is, this random guy, um, just like that song that we sing, right? I'm just on the road, and then suddenly meeting this person whom I've never met before. And she doesn't know that she needs the gift of God. She doesn't know who, who this person is that is speaking to her. And then suddenly he's talking about living water. Now, she's not dumb, okay? When, but when someone talks about living water your mind would have gone to actual body of water. And not just a puddle, but like a river that is connected to the sea. So a, a body of water that is continually refreshed and, and moving. That's what her mind uh, went to, okay? Living water, you're now talking about a, sp a spring, a spring of water. Um, and this is similar to what Nicodemus experienced, right? When Jesus talked about being born again, what did Nicodemus think? Nicodemus thought, how can I be born again? You want me to go back to my mother's womb? That's impossible, right? So again, this is the same. 
um, the woman is saying, what living water? You, you don't even have anything to draw water with. What, what are you talking about? So Jesus is saying something spiritual, but our mind is still connected to the physical things. And we fail to see the spiritual things because our minds are often still attached to the physical things. And same issue, okay? We, we have the same issue as this woman. And this woman is thinking, I come here every day to draw water. And there's many interpretations why she comes to draw water in the afternoon. It's hot, right? It's quite a long way from Sikar, from her town Sikar to this well. If you were her, in that, if you were in, the, in that position, when you hear this, of course you're like, okay, um, I want to have this water where I never have to go back and draw water from. Right? So there's a lot of conjectures here as well. Why is this woman drawing water in the afternoon? Why isn't she going with her mates? Right? Why, why is she alone? Why, why, why doesn't she go along with her other friends? We don't know at this point. I'll assume we don't know because some of you may not have read this story before. And drawing water from the well is exhausting. right? I can imagine it's exhausting. Um, it's just pulling buckets of water every day, going back and forth. So she heard this offer and she's like, all right, um, if you can give me this water, now she's interested, right? Now she's, she's, she's curious. What is this living water? Um, but she's still thinking about physical water. But we know that physical water means that, I'm going to do the cliche, I'm going to drink water. Okay. Physical water may satisfy your thirst for a little bit. And then you need to drink. You need to drink again. Okay. And that's Jesus' point here. Okay. If you if you just drink physical water, Day after day, you still have to return to this well. Day after day, she will feel that sense of, I have to draw water from here. I have to come here alone. I have to come here by myself. That water that she draws from this well that sounds so amazing is inferior to the water that Jesus is about to offer her. Okay? Because Jesus said to her right in verse 10, if you knew the gift of God, Right? You will not be saying, give me a drink. You will not be, uh, if, you know the gift, if you knew the gift of God and you know me, you will be this, the one saying to me, give me a drink. Give me this water. And now she is curious. But, let's read again in verse 15 to 18. So she said, the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have come here to draw, or have to come here to draw water. And then, probably the weirdest of um, change of conversation ever recorded in history, Jesus said to her, go, call your husband and come here. Right? Suddenly, from water, and then now talking about husband. Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him. So if, if I may add, in brackets, the woman answered him, in brackets, matter of factly, right? As a matter of fact, only, okay? The woman said to him, I have no husband. Now she's not lying here, okay? She's not lying here. I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband. For you have had five husbands. Okay, what happened to the five, nobody knows. So we can speculate again. Did they all divorce her? Possible. Did they all die? Also possible. Okay. Sad, but also possible. But we can only speculate what happened to the five husbands. But the point is, he went through man after man after man after man after man after man. Okay. Five, five husbands. And the one you now have is not your husband. So Jesus said, you're not lying to me. What you have said is true. We often do this, right? When someone places us in an uncomfortable position, we are, you know, we're good Christians. We don't lie. But 
we just tell them something enough, but not the full truth. But I'm not lying. This is the truth. So I'm not sinning. Okay? This is gray area. So she's saying, I have no husband. That is right. Um, so now Jesus is tightening the screw, right? So first she, he, first he asked for the water. Now, he's, now it's, the situation is turned around where she wants the water. And now Jesus is tightening the screw in step three where the woman wants this water. But Jesus has to reveal to her that this water is not just physical water, but this water is water that will cleanse her of sin. So in order to do this, Jesus had to tell her, go get your husband. Okay, And any other person, you and I, any other person, any other traveler, will just, oh, okay, you have no husband, fine. And then move on from the conversation. But this is not any man. This is Jesus. So Jesus then further exposes, right? He then said, okay, you're not with a husband at the moment. You don't have a husband, but you are with a man. So at a minimum, they are not married. The worst, she's sleeping with some other woman's husband. So now you can see how in a small town, she is alienated from the other woman because he's, she, is, she was you know, seen as the husband stealer, right? The husband, the family wrecker, the woman who wrecks other people's families. So that's why she had to go to the well alone. She had no friends to go to the well with. And now... Again, she's not a dumb woman, okay? She wasn't a dumb woman. And she then sees that, oh, this guy, how could this guy know, right? Back then, you know, there's no social media where she posts stuff. So how could this guy, who is a random stranger, know everything about me? I haven't posted anything online, you know? So I, I cannot understand. So you must be a special person. You must be... At least, this guy who's asking me for water, at least must be a prophet. So, Jesus is promoted, right? From a random traveler, now is a prophet. Okay, moving on into verse 19 to 24. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Okay. Now, I did say that this woman is not dumb. So one day when I meet her in heaven, she will not be unhappy with me. Okay. She is a smart lady. I perceive that you are a prophet. But it doesn't take perception powers to know that this Jesus was special. Because if someone can tell you that something that no one else knows, and it's a random person, must be special. It must be a prophet. Okay, so I perceive that you are a prophet. Verse 20, our fathers, so her ancestors, worship on this mountain. But you, Jewish people, that, but you Jewish people say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You, Samaritans, worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. And this line, salvation is from the Jews, is important because Jesus is a Jewish person, right? So salvation is from him. He's saying that. Salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming, and it's now here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is speaking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. So, I used to think that this woman is trying to deflect. You know when someone, again, puts you under the spotlight, you try to start another topic, right? So, you don't get interrogated into your issues. I thought that was, that's what she was doing. But after reading more commentaries, 
I understand that she's actually not being, she's not deflecting, okay? She is starting a new topic, but she's actually now seeing that I am sinful. This man has identified I am a sinful woman. So then she thinks, how can I be freed from this sin? How can I be cleansed from my sin? Like after they talk about water, right? But her mind again goes to religion. Okay? Her mind goes to religious practice. So you're a prophet, right? You're a prophet. And you have to give her credit, right? She's met someone spiritual. She wants to start a spiritual conversation. We often don't, okay? We often still like to talk about physical things, okay? Temporal things. But this woman is like, okay, this guy has the solution to my sin problem. So prophet, random prophet sitting by the well, tell me. My ancestors tell me I have to worship here. Your people tell you that you worship there. Who is right? So she wants to get the answers. She's actually curious about spiritual things. So that's already a positive compared to Nicodemus. Okay, if you read back the story of Nicodemus, Nicodemus is just like if you play badminton, like just deflect, 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 like defense. Okay, just um, <laughs> he's under the pump, so he's just defending. But this woman is actually curious. And Jesus is talking about spirit and in truth. And this is um, Jesus saying to her um, that one day, right, in verse 23, the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. No longer about a place, but you will worship in spirit and in truth, not about a place anymore. And you can see this uh, in this in this picture, which is found in Genesis 28, verse 16 to 17. Let's turn back again. So that's why we have this connection to Jacob, right? Jacob's well. Um, Genesis 28, verse 16 to 17. So this is the story of Jacob. 16. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So this is the story of Jacob having a vision of a ladder um, from that connects heaven to earth and seeing angels going up and down like the escalator, okay? The escalator of heaven. And the same story or a similar story, similar picture can be found in John chapter 1, verse 47 to 51. John chapter 1, verse 47 to 51. Jesus met um, Nathaniel. Jesus saw Nathaniel coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathaniel said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him. Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathaniel answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe? You will see greater things than this. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. So it's no longer about a place. So in the Old Testament, it's about a place, about a temple. It's about this place called Bethel, right? Where Jacob saw a ladder going up and down. But Jesus said here, in verse 51, you will see heaven open and angels of God ascending and descending on Jesus, on the Son of Man. So Jesus will be the mediator, will be the person whom we find God true. So let's continue in John chapter 4 again, verse 25 to 26. So you have to imagine this is like um, building up, right? Um, in music, this is nearly the climax of the song, the crescendo. It keeps on building and building. In verse 25, the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming. Again, she's a smart woman, okay? She knows her word at least her, the Samaritan version of the word. They know that there's a Messiah coming in verse 25. He who is called Christ, when he comes, he will tell us all things. 
Ah, okay. So you as a prophet, you cannot tell me where to worship. So she's still not sure at this point. This guy doesn't want to answer me. Okay? But when the Messiah comes, he can tell me all things. And so beautiful, in verse 26, Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. And this verse is deliberately structured as such that it throws back to the moment when Moses was standing in front of the burning bush. I am what I am. So, and what's even more beautiful is Jesus never revealed himself as a Messiah in front of the Pharisees, in front of the Jewish people. But to a Samaritan woman, he said, I am the Messiah. That, that's beautiful because he offers grace to people who don't deserve grace, to people who reject grace. But grace seems to be um, something that's not valued by people who think they are righteous, they can do things with their own strength, they can fulfill the commands of God with their own strength. So we go back to that saying of Jesus, right? Uh, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. So Jesus is saying, I am the Messiah. At that moment is when her eyes were open. But maybe not fully open, but when her eyes were like, he's the Messiah. He's the Messiah, right? He's the Messiah. And verse 27 to 30, I have to charge through these last few verses. Verses 27 to 23, okay? We'll skip verse 27, okay? His disciples came back, etc. Verse 28. So the woman left her water jar. The woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, Come. This is the, a weird, weird verse. Okay, Come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Okay. This shame that she has is suddenly gone. She's now telling her townspeople who she stays away from. Right? She has to go to the well by herself. And, but now she's running to the town and she's telling everyone, hey, someone knows everything I've ever done. Have you ever done that? I've never done that. Right? If I have a secret, someone knows, hey, man, keep it between us, yeah? Keep it between us, keep it quiet. But she's, not, she's like, I met someone who knows everything I've ever done. And then she asked the question, can this be the Christ? Right? She's not f saying this is the Christ. She's asking the question, can this be the Christ? So then the people became curious. They went out of the town and were coming to him. So she invited people. So when she received the news that this is the Messiah, she's seen the light, she wants to run out to the, her townspeople and share the light. Right? So different to Nicodemus. Okay? Nicodemus continued to live in the darkness at that point. And the way she asks, can this be the Christ, you know, may have made her townspeople, her, her, her um, fellow Samaritans curious. So then they came out to see Jesus. And verse 39 to 42, yeah, just to conclude. Many Samaritans from that town believe in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did, right? It's a strange testimony, right? Usually testimony is touching and moving, but this is, her testimony is, he told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, and this is so important for us to understand, right? They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. So he invited um, the woman first. And then the woman saw the light. And then the woman ran out to share the light. But it didn't stop there. right? The townspeople chased after the light as well. And then the light shone into their lives. And they truly believe, many of them believe that Jesus is the Savior of the world. And um, just to conclude, uh, I invite the music team to come up. I suddenly remember 
<coughs> this quote um, from C.S. Lewis. Right? I might have said before, like C.S. Lewis was a huge. Um, C.S. Lewis was a huge influence in me becoming a Christian. Okay, because I was a skeptic. Me, a skeptic. Okay, long conversation. Next time, anyone who wants to talk to me, I can explain. Okay. Um, in one of his books, uh, it's called The Weight of Glory, he's, uh, he, he wrote this. It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong. Okay, so talking about the water is talking about desires and satisfying our desires. It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies. Anyone knows what mud pies are? Right? You, you wet some sand and then you yeah, thicken them, they become mud pies. They want to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. So our problems are not our desires. You notice here, Jesus never said to the woman, don't have any desires. Kill your desires. Right? You know why, that is, why Jesus never said that? Because that's not Christianity. That is Buddhism. That is other religions. Jesus said, have your desires, but your desires must be pointed to the right direction. And that is to me. So it's not, our problem is not because we have desires, but because we are far too easily pleased. Okay, so many of us may come here with um, different expectations, you know, when you, we come to church. Um, if you remember like Isaiah in the sermon last week, okay, he kept coming to the temple day after day, maybe week after week, but he never met, he never expected to meet the Lord, right? He never expected to meet um, the Lord in all His glory appearing, but He did. And it's the same with this woman. He never expected, she never expected to meet a guy, a Jewish guy, speaking to her and asking for water. So some of you may come here this morning and, all right, let's just get this over with. Um, <clears throat> but Jesus wants you to place your desires, surrender your desires, um, and it can truly be fulfilled when you come to Him, when you're satisfied in Him. Okay, so. Jesus, we pray <clears throat> this morning, Lord, um, that only You know our true spiritual conditions, only You know our our hearts, O oh Lord. So we pray that the Holy Spirit may reveal to us our deepest and darkest um, secrets that no one else knows, O oh Lord. We want to bring them to you. We want you to fill us, Lord, with that living water once again. That only you can quench our thirst, O oh Lord. Only you can satisfy our hearts, Lord. Who can satisfy our soul, O oh Lord, but you alone? Who can fulfill our deepest desires but you alone, O oh Lord? And we pray, may your word speak to us, rebuke us, but also draw us in, woo us, invite us, Lord, so that we can truly see what you want to do um, after you give the living water in our lives. That we also want to share this water, this living water with our friends, with our families. We want to share the light that you have shown us, Lord, so that the world may not be living in darkness anymore. That they may enjoy a life of pleasures only in you alone, O oh Lord. We pray, Holy Spirit, show us, show us, O oh Lord, that we may not be afraid to come to the light, 
that we may not be a f- shying away from the light, but we will step into the light because there you will change us, you will wash us, and you will transform us, O oh Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I pray for my brothers and sisters, O oh Lord, that may they may get an understanding from you, that they may see you loving them, that they may see you, Jesus, dying on the cross for them, is to ask them, invite them, Lord, to come to you and surrender everything into your hands. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.